Excellencies, distinguished guests, thank you for joining us for this session on innovating, planning, and modernizing irrigation and water resources management for climate mitigation and adaptation. My name is Benoit Bosquet. I'm the Regional Director for Sustainable Development for East Asia and uh, the Pacific at the World Bank, and I'm very pleased to moderate this session. We are facing multiple crises, putting decades of hard-won development gains at risk. Food insecurity is one such crisis. This year, 222 million people in 53 countries are facing acute food insecurity. Feeding 10 billion people in 2050 will require efficient water allocation and scaling up and modernizing irrigation. And that is why we are gathered here today at COP27 in Sharm el -Sheikh. Irrigation consumes 70% of the world's fresh water. We divert more water to agriculture than is needed for food production. This has to change. Our distinguished guests will share their experiences and views on the following aspects. First, we will talk about modernizing irrigation systems. We need to produce more food with less water while increasing our resilience to climate change. Modernizing irrigation systems means technical and managerial upgrading, but also institutional reforms to improve resource utilization, where governments have an essential role to play. That is to create enabling environments and providing incentives for an efficient sector. Ideally, one that is led by farmers and can also attract private sector financing. Second, we will touch on disruptive technologies. They can help farmers improve their livelihoods by using inputs more efficiently and by enhancing the yields and quality of their crops. The digital transformation of agriculture involves the adoption of technologies to enable new business models and financing solutions. Third and finally, we will link improved irrigation to climate change mitigation and the decarbonization of agriculture. Food systems and land use, as you know, cause one third of all greenhouse gas emissions and are the first emitter of methane gas. Around 10%, in fact, of global methane emissions come from rice alone. Alternate wetting and drying and enhanced fertilizer management can reduce water use by 30% and cut methane emissions in half. Let me turn now to our guests. And to get us started, I'm very happy to invite His Excellency Hani Sewilam, the Minister of Water Resources and Irrigation of Egypt, to present key, key uh, note speed. So, would you like to speak from here? So, good afternoon and excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, and also thank you for inviting me here. I think you have been speaking about a very important topic, which is irrigation and deep water scarcity, but also challenge change. Do you hearing me well? Okay. So. Uh, Yeah. Thank you. So uh, the challenge of irrigation and using water to produce more with less, and here, of course, so speaking about he producing more food with less water is a big challenge for a country that is scarce in terms of water resources. First of all, a country like Egypt that has a water share per capita reaching 500 cubic meter uh, per capita per year, which means 
far below the water poverty line, which, as you know, 1,000 cubic meter per capita, then we have to think about how we use the water for producing food. If the um, global average of using fresh water for producing food is 70 percent, the average in Egypt annually is 80%. So we use 80% of our water resources for food production or for irrigated agriculture. So slight change in the technologies, on the methodologies, in the approach will have big impact. And that's why we are very carefully, especially in the previous years, dealing with our irrigation system and dealing with our canals. You have heard all from the canal rehabilitation project. The project aims to transport the water to the farmers in a more efficient way to, to give the farmer the water in the right quantity, the right timing and the sufficient quality. And also moving from surface irrigation in some areas to modern irrigation or drip irrigation or a sprinkler is one of the objectives of the government. But here we do have challenges. We have challenges because the issue is not that easy. Move from uh, uh, surface irrigation, especially in an area like the Nile Delta, which is quite saline soil, then the movement has to be done very carefully. It has to be studied. The technology has to be adapted to the uh, situation. But also, if we really do care about sustainability, we have to think about the environmental impact. Impact. In this case, the salinity and the recharge of the groundwater and the interface between the groundwater and the, 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 um, the, the seawater, because we have sea level rise and moving the entire delta to drip irrigation means less recharging for the aquifer and less recharging for the aquifer means that the pumping in different locations will deplete the groundwater and depleting the groundwater on the other side of the Mediterranean or in the Mediterranean, there is a sea level rise, will cause more salt water intrusion. So the issue is not that easy. So when we move from surface irrigation to other types of irrigation, we have to do it based on careful studies because we do care about the sustainability. As I said, the environmental dimension is very important for us. Yes, moving to drip irrigation is part of the solution, but as I said, carefully, because this is, will help the farmer to increase the productivity now, but it has to sustain. So the economic dimension has to be considered, the environmental dimension has to be considered, but also the social dimension and the socioeconomics are the small scale farmers in Egypt, in Africa and everywhere can afford this move from the easy and low cost irrigation to a little bit more expensive irrigation? Are they are, can afford it? Especially we have the land fragmentation. We have small lands here. People are having 0 0.2, 0 0.3 acre per family. So is moving from the simple irrigation to modern irrigation will be economically visible for these small scale farmers because they have to install a pump, a filter, a pipelines, drippers, and then and, and. will they be able to bring this money back after such investment? I'm not speaking only about Egypt. I'm speaking about small scale farmers. So we need to study this. If we're really speaking about SDGs and reaching the SDGs, we have to consider the three pillars of sustainability, the economic dimension of our action, the social dimension of the action, and also the ecological and environmental dimension of our action. So these have to be considered, and it's because it's easy to hear in the COP in different sessions, moving to smart agriculture, which is smart. Are we speaking about smart in the sense of wireless internet and uh, drones and sensors to measure the uh, soil moisture and, and, and for a farmer who was hardly uh, 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 providing food for the family from an area that's not bigger than this area, which is in the Delta, this is the situation. Fragment, land fragmentation is a huge problem. So we have to be very careful when we bring ideas that are quite modern, that are coming from countries that they were successful over there. I'm not criticizing the technology, but I have to be careful when I implement the ideas in countries based on their circumstances. Yes, we adapt to climate change, but 
that even our solutions have to be adapted to the local circumstances. Thank you very much, and I wish you a successful session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Excellency uh, Sewilam, uh, on the, uh, your remarks on the importance to balance uh, technology, economy, and social and environmental aspects. And the minister may stay with us uh, for a few minutes, but obviously he is uh, extremely uh, solicited. Let me now uh, turn uh, online to our second guest, uh, Mr. Jai Shroff, who is the chairman and the chief executive officer of UPL Limited. Uh, Mr. Shroff, please offer uh, your thoughts on uh, private sector, uh, private sector perspective on innovation and modernization in irrigation. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. It's a pleasure to, to be there virtually. I had the honor of being there in person last week. Um, UPL is a, is, a, is a world leader in sustainable technologies for agriculture. Coming from India and, and really understanding the challenges agriculture and particularly smallholders farmers face uh, in the whole um, uh, impact of climate change. Uh, we uh, have been investing hundreds of millions of dollars over the last 10 years uh, to develop technologies to improve farmer resilience. And farmer resilience and sustainable agriculture really go hand in hand as, uh, as a subject. When you talk about water stress, when you talk about uh, the, the weather changes and long periods of dry spell and excessive rain, the biggest impact is for the smallholder farmers. And at UPL, we have been focusing on sustainable agriculture and farmer resilience. And I believe that the world needs to recognize that farmers need to be rewarded and recognized for sustainable behavior. As uh, our speakers and the minister has uh, already said, that a lot of sustainable technologies all, already exist, like drip irrigation, like uh, you know, soil management, uh, soil health, and so many other technologies are being developed today to make agriculture more climate resilient. But, but we need to, like we are in, uh, incentivizing all the other technologies, all the other industries like e electric vehicles, solar energy, we need to create a reward system. And I'm really happy to see uh, at COP that agriculture is becoming such a much more important topic of discussion. Because as rightly said, a huge amount of greenhouse gases uh, gets generated by not only rice, but so many other crops. And today, technology exists to reduce uh, this easily by 10 to 15 percent and a 10 to 15 percent reduction in uh, greenhouse gases from agriculture is very possible with technologies which are going to actually reduce the cost of farmers uh, of production for farmers and increase productivity through our experiments in with our technology particularly to uh, uh, water management technology we have been able to identify and prove that 25 percent of the 25% uh, of the actually greenhouse gases uh, uh, and 25% of the yield by fa for farmers is lost by uh, uh, due to water water stress and it is not abject drought just because of the heat stress and the water stress the the the, the loss of flowering causes a 25% reduction Today at UPL, we are working with about one and a half million cotton farmers to reduce water stress. We are working with about 400,000 sugarcane farmers, 400,000 acres of sugarcane uh, to reduce water by 30 uh, percent. We have about a million acres of uh, of rice farmers who are adopting, um, as as our host uh, was saying, the AWD process and we will be generating about a million tons of carbon uh, uh, offsets for that. And these sort of things are going to enable and encourage farmers to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. And as I was saying, we really need to bring them in this challenge to fight climate change. So agriculture needs to be a tool 
not not uh, only uh, the reason for climate change. And if we set up uh, reward systems and recognition systems, uh, we will be able to do a lot more, not only on, on pr increasing food production, but also towards uh, 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 you know, climate mitigation technologies. Because with all the work we are doing in about 138 countries uh, where UPL is present, we, we are finding that any technology farmers are willing to, to adopt, provided they, they have an economic, uh, an economic drive. And there's no reason not to include agriculture as a, as a, uh, as a partner in uh, fighting climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Shroff. It's uh, so good to hear an enlightened uh, speaker from a major private company emphasize the need for rewarding uh, farmers. It gives me a great joy. Let me now uh, uh, turn to His Excellency Bright, Rami Rama, Minister of State for Animal hum Husbandry of Uganda, who will talk to us about building climate resilience uh, at scale through farmer-led uh, irrigation. The floor is yours, sir. Good afternoon, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. First, uh, this is a very interesting uh, topic, building climate resilience for agriculture. I will talk about Ugandan experience, the challenges and opportunities, and then make a general statement about what we think about the subject matter. Uganda is agriculture-driven economic and rural development strategies have responded to shifting realities of the last decade by accelerating irrigation and development. Climate change has forced our historical reliance on rain-fed agricultural production to shift dramatically, particularly for high-value horticulture and export crops that are both important and vulnerable to increased rainfall variability. In 2018, the government of Uganda put in place a national adaptation plan for agricultural sector, which with the with the goal of increasing resilience of the sector to impacts of climate change through coordinated intervention that enhance sustainable agriculture, food and nutrition security. In 2018, again, the government of Uganda put, a place, put in place an irrigation policy planning for accelerated irrigation development to reach 1.5 million hectares by 2040 from a baseline of 100,000 uh, hectares. This ambitious goal can only be achieved by addressing critical limitation, namely a high unit investment cost, slow speed of developing appropriately efficient small-scale irrigation technologies and packages, and the inadequate knowledge and skills of farmers, extension officers at the private sector in the provision of irrigation technologies. The program approach. The government launched a micro-scale irrigation program that addressed these critical constraints. The program catalyzes small holder farmers' action to purchase and utilize uh, individual micro-irrigation equipment. Supported by the World Bank, the program relies on decentralized strategy implemented by the district local government and the Minister of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries across the whole country. The program supported smallholder farmers up to one hectare to purchase and utilize individual irrigation equipment for intensive production, drawing on the ex extensive and easily accessible water resources, typically shallow uh, groundwater, perennial stream rivers. The program benefits smallholder farmers wanting to translate from subsistence to market-oriented business farming and underpinned by agricultural knowledge component that strives to effective and efficient water land resource utilization, leading to increased productivity and pro production and productivity. 
developing market for equipment and strengthening private sector ability, provide both technical services and microfinancing for farmers is one of the targeted outcomes for the adopted approach. Personalized irrigation solutions are provided to individual farmers with site-specific advance given technical and optional cost. Farmers are technically guided by agriculture extension officers whose knowledge and capacity are enhanced by the program specialized training in digital application. The micro scale irrigation program is extended to, to impact at scale. In the first year, over 20,000 farmers expressed interest in joining, of which 20 were women. Local government staff carried out 8,000 technical farm visits. The speed of the approach is evident in the establishment of over 100 systems in only six months over approximately 500 hectares. These achievements were reached despite the hurdles of COVID-19 COVID pandemic, inflation, and global supply chain challenges. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we have opportunities and challenges in Uganda. Knowledge and capability of frontline government staff remain central success of this program. The agriculture minister remains committed to increasing capacity and providing them with the necessary tools to keep providing high quality services to the farmers. Conclusion. The potential for massive expansion of the micro irrigation in Uganda is not limited by water and land availability. Most farmers are potentially able and, and interested in farming as, as business, both for local and regional export markets. A small fraction of natural human and market oriented has yet been touched. A rapid expansion of irrigation through farmer led approach contributes to government's goal of agro-industrialization, but we require address issues highlighted under 2018 National Adaptation Plan for the agricultural sector, for example, accelerating cap cap capacitation of frontline uh, agriculture extension officers, more engagement to resolve the systematic challenges faced by the private sector, input suppliers, financial institutions, issuance of companies, mindset change of the farmers, adapting more ambitious climate change ambition and mitigation measures. I want to say that it's no longer a choice for us to, to depend on rain-fed agriculture. It is a must that we have to irrigate. It is a must that we have to do, do things differently if we have to address the challenges of the world food crisis now. Uganda is a, a very endowed with natural resources but along the way, we have realized that we have to change the way of thinking. We have to change the way of doing things. We have to put money in the agricultural sector if we have to feed the world population. Addressing these critical constraints will enable Uganda to optimize to fuller extent on its rich natural resource base and the unique set of experience and interna in international agricultural networks uh, for better results. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency. Uh, again, uh, very good remarks uh, on uh, the importance of technology, but also extension services, right? A very, very good point. And um, let me now uh, turn to uh, Son Excellence, uh, Le Ministre Niza Baraka, Ministre de l'Equipement du Royaume du Maroc, uh, and I think you will talk about resilience, resilient water resources management. Thank you very much. I would like, first of all, to thank the World Bank to have to given us this opportunity. And also, I would like to, to thank the World Bank for the new report they did about Morocco, about the climate change. 
And why I'm talking about this point? Because uh, in these reports, the World Bank says that uh, the reduction in water availability and the drop in crop yield due to climate change could reduce our GDP by up to 6.5%. That's why it's very important to work on this topic and to see how we can really have a real management of, of water and how we can do it with the agriculture sector because the agriculture sector use 80% of our water. And uh, what Morocco is doing now, I will talk about three pillars. The first pillar is about the, the management of the agriculture water demand. We have a national irrigation water saving program. This national uh, irrigation saving program let us uh, develop the local irrigation. Now we have 700,000 hectares on local irrigation. We want to move by 2030 about more than 1 million hectares, and it will give us the opportunity to reduce very much the, the use of water for agriculture. The second important thing we're trying to do, and I would like to underline this point, we are moving for, on desalinization. You know that in Morocco we have one, uh, 140 uh, million cubic meters on desalinization. We will move by 2030 to 1 billion cubic meters thanks to desalinization. And the third of this water will go to irrigation. And then we, the, the farmers will pay on, on, part, on PPPs the real cost of water on the civilization to develop their agriculture. Third important thing, we will also use the reuse wastewater on agriculture sector. That's the new step we are trying to develop it. And, uh, and it will be done first on, on trees and then other kinds of products on agriculture. I would like also to talk about we decide to stop subsidizing some crops using a lot of water. I'm talking about avocado, as Mr. Minister said, but also other, other important uh, cultures. And it's, it's very important because we are working with the Minister of Agriculture to do a real uh, map of what kind of crops we can do in each region. Then it's a territorial approach, not a national approach. I think with the representatives of the region who are there, it's the only way to have a real use of water and a real valorization of water on the future with saving water. I would like also to add on this important thing that we consider on, on, in Morocco that uh, we, we need to have a real national plan of water until 2050. And His Majesty the King decided and he told us that we have to have this plan and we will prepare it for next year. And then we will see exactly what kind of mobilization of water we will have for each region, on, thanks to dams, but also thanks uh, to desalinization and reusing water. Second important thing is how to do saving water and the demand, how to manage the demand. And the third important thing I will, I will finish with, conclude with this point, is about the groundwater. We, we have to save our water on the ground. And for this, we need to have a real integrated management with the farmers, with the industries, with also uh, the people for, and, and we have to change our, our uh, uh, and to have a commitment of people to change their way to consume water on the future. That's our goal, and thank you very much. Yes, uh, next, I would like to, in to invite uh, Joao Galamba, uh, His Excellency Joao Galamba, Secretary of State for Environment and Energy uh, of Portugal, to talk to us about uh, water management challenges in a drought context, because Portugal also knows that. Thank you. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the, the World Bank for this invitation. Um, 
climate change and its effect on uh, water resources is already um, uh, a reality for Portugal. Um, we've um, some say that uh, in the only uh, we only had one normal year since 2010. I would like to pose the this result in a different way. I'm, I'm going to say that we only had one normal year since 2000. And all the years were normal uh, since 2010, except one which was the a normal one uh, that only existed to remind us how it used to be now, not how it will be. So Portugal is already living with uh, extreme drought. Portugal is a, a country that has more than having a, a water scarcity we have water distribution problems because we in the north we have a lot of water and in the center and the south no so uh, we have water scarcity but our main problem is the strong asymmetries in our territory this uh, uh, this year is uh, uh, one of the worst droughts ever. Um, Portugal is heavily dependent on uh, hydropower. We, it represents 25 to 30 percent of our energy mix, and this year it dropped 50 percent. So this is we are living in an extreme, uh, extremely stressful situation. And the first response that we need uh, uh, that Portugal gives to, to this fact is a long-term planning for resilience. Portugal has dealt with droughts in the past, but this is now gonna be a common feature of our water resources. So um, the first key message is uh, proper uh, planning for resilience, and we're doing that. We've had strategic plans for many times, uh, and now we are finalizing our strategic plan for water supply, wastewater, and stormwater management. And uh, the, the novelty here is uh, stormwater management. So we've had this strategic plan for many years. We are adding now uh, stormwater in order to take advantage of, uh, well, include also in our uh, planning um, the rain, which is something that we didn't do before. Um, then the second challenge apart from long-term planning both strategic and investment plans, is collaboration between different uses, different sectors, and different countries. And Portugal has these challenges in all areas. So we need to articulate uh, human consumption, agriculture, and energy, and we do that. There is strategic articulation between these three uses. Uh, in the ministry where I work, we we have energy and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and water, but we don't have agriculture. And agriculture represents 75% of our consumption and is by far uh, the sector with the most losses. So it's a key uh, element to have not only in our strategic planning, but also in our strategic collaboration and ongoing collaboration between different uses. Then also collaboration between different countries, because uh, we not only need to articulate human consumption, agriculture, and energy, but we need, and in the case of Portugal, we need to articulate with Spain. Uh, uh, most of our rivers come from Spain, so there is no water management in Portugal that is not articulated with Spain. It's an impossibility. So collaboration with Spain, dealing with the, this, uh, um, with uh, uh, the drought implies strong uh, collaboration between these two countries. We have an international convention for water management uh, that implies um, close collaboration between the two countries in managing this difficult situation. Then, uh, of course, we need, uh, we need to use technology. I'm not a techno-utopian, I'm a techno-realist, but reality has given us enough uh, excellent results in the past that seemed like utopias for me to say, well, the proper position to be regarding technology is realists because they have given us enough utopias for us to be con to, to, for, so that we can be considered uh, realists, although in reality we are utopians. Uh, yes, uh, technology is crucial. Technology is nothing uh, uh, without collaboration and long-term planning, but long-term planning and collaboration are nothing without technology. So we need to have these three dimensions uh, really present. And we're doing it now in Portugal. We need uh, technology to decrease water consumption, to become more efficient. So technology there is critical, and it's critical uh, um, that the uh, uh, one of the main uses agriculture uses abundant, abundantly and creatively as much technology to reduce the water consumption as possible. 
also in water reutilization. It's an area that we would want to explore. Portugal reutilizes and recycles very little water. We want it's one of our priorities now, and, and for this technology, it's also key. And um, and. And this is basically an ongoing effort because it, it is never done. You never plan uh, for something, you execute it, and then uh, the problem is solved. This requires uh, articulation, collaboration between all of these uh, uh, stakeholders and all going and ongoing because this is a strategic problem, a, a structural problem that will be uh, with us forever. We are quite confident that we can improve because there are examples around the world. Someone talk hear about, uh, um, I think it was the Egyptian minister, uh, it doesn't mean that what worked in uh, other countries works in our countries, but at least it should be inspiring experiences uh, that we should adapt if possible. And yes, we want to do that. There are excellent experiences around the world and close to this region uh, regarding water use and uh, excellent examples in agriculture. So I would say that's one of our top priorities. And just to finalize, um, uh, I'm also the Secretary of State of Energy. Uh, our main role in energy is to reduce water to a backup, uh, um, uh, to a backup um, position. So currently, we use a lot of water when there is wind and when there is sun. Our challenge is to reduce water use in uh, uh, power uh, production to only use it when there is no sun or when there is no wind. So uh, I would say that asymptotically, water will become more and more um, a backup use uh, for energy production and not just another way to generate electricity. This does not mean that it will reduce its, uh, uh, its role. It will actually be a key substitute for natural gas. Thank you very much. Yes. This works. Okay. Okay, very good. Thank you so much, uh, Excellency uh, Galamba, on uh, highlighting uh, a lot of, again, the, the same uh, problems, scarcity, spatial inequality, uh, the need for uh, good uh, water resources planning uh, and uh, to consider all the uh, sectors that require uh, water, in particular agriculture uh, and, uh, and, uh, and energy and the ecological functions, of course. Thank you so much. As always, it's a run against time here at the COP. Uh, and I do uh, wish to give the floor to three more speakers. Uh, so I will ask uh, next... Uh, Mr. Nguyen uh, Hu Tien, uh, to speak to us uh, from uh, Vietnam about managing water in the Mekong Delta. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Um uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, World Bank, for uh, inviting me, to, uh, for allowing me to share our experience and perspective and plan um, how to manage the Delta. Um, I have some, some uh, slides to share, but uh, okay, it's not working. You, you, have anyway, three, uh, you have three minutes. I just want to tell okay. you. Three minutes, please. Okay, so the Delta is situ situated um, at the downstream most part of the Mekong uh, Basin, so it's faced with uh, a multi-dimensional uh, crisis with challenges coming from upstream, including climate change from upstream and hydropower and sea level rise and climate change, of course, and and uh, from the development misstep that we, the way we treated our our own delta. So uh, the delta is at the, the Mekong delta is at the crossroad, and we cannot continue the old path. And so we need a new way. So the new way, um, recognizing the, the, the issues, the government in 2017 issued the resolution 120, and under that we have developed um, uh, an integrated plan for the Delta. The, the spirit is that we not going to fight with nature, and we're going to transform uh, our own livelihoods, our own agriculture to adapt to adapt to the to the changes instead of using 
the fortress defense approach like before. And um, in the future, we're going to retreat the we're going to retreat the fresh water because the fresh water zone into land because salinity is inevitable in the context of climate change and because of the uncertainties coming from upstream. Okay, so we have, during the process we have uh, drawn six lessons for delta management, and we hope that the the lessons are useful for other deltas around the world. Number one is that uh, a delta is a living body with organs, uh, functioning organs and processes. And number two, water is not just cubic meters. When talking about water for a healthy delta, we need to think about quantity, quality, and the processes that support, that sustain the, the natural system so that the, the delta uh, as a living body can be sustained. Number three, GDP is not everything. Uh, we shouldn't squeeze uh, the delta uh, for GDP performance, for maximizing GDP performance. Uh, it's, not, it's not sustainable that way. And number four, one needs to respect the, the natural laws because in uh, managing deltas, if we don't respect um, the laws of nature, there will be a price to be paid. Number five, uh, regional coordination is needed because climate change doesn't know administrative boundaries that humans uh, divide. Um, number six, uh, it's important to apply the no regret principle uh, when adapt to uh, climate change because climate change protections are always uh, containing a lot of uncertainties. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Tian, on uh, the harsh reality of trying to save uh, the Mekong Delta uh, from increasing salinity, land subsidence, and sea level rise. Um, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Uh, Monica Porto, who is the head of environmental, social, and governance at the large uh, water and waste management utility Sabes in Sao, Sao Paulo. So well, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Bouquet. Thank you for the World Bank for uh, this panel, for giving Sabesp this uh, important opportunity to share uh, our experience with a significant drought that affected the state of Sao Paulo in 2014-2015. And uh, uh, early this morning, uh, Professor Braga was presenting the, the current situation of the, the drought in the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil uh, to supply the metropolitan region of Sao Paulo. We have been, uh, in, for the last 25 years, we have been under the, below the, the, the long-term average of flows. So uh, droughts for us are uh, reality. And uh, even though Sabesp is a water utility company in this panel of, uh, that speaks most of irrigation, I think that our uh, experience and consequent actions uh, during and after the drought can contribute uh, to the discussion of water security as well as the mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Sabespi invested a lot in increasing resilience of the systems by investing in infrastructure in creating redundancy in the water supply systems in order to, de to decrease our vulnerability. Uh, new systems were built to serve as additional supply when flows through the regular system are below average. So uh, this is one of the examples. Uh, the other example is to continuing investment in demand management by reducing water losses. So Sabesp invested almost $2 billion in the last 10 years in water loss reduction. So we are, uh, we are working on both sides. We are working on 
uh, increasing our sources, increasing our infrastructure, increasing our supply, but also we are working on uh, controlling uh, our, man, our, our demand uh, to reduce the demand management. So I think that it's, it's, uh, it's a good example that uh, in order to, to, uh, to increase the resilience, we have to work on, on both sides. Uh, not only we are investing in adaptation, but we are also investing in mitigation for instance, uh, using solar power uh, to provide energy to wastewater treatment plants. As you may know, uh, Brazil is a, is a country that most of the energy comes from hydropower. 78%, uh, 80% of our energy comes from hydropower, so it's quite a lot. But due to the decrease of flows uh, in the last decades, we have been using more and more thermal plants. So uh, we are in Sabespi, we are also investing in uh, solar power to provide uh, energy in a more sustainable way. Uh, we are also investing in floating solar panels uh, on our reservoirs to produce solar power. Uh, we recognize that the investment in adaptation and mitigation is quite large and financing is an essential part of this discussion, but uh, we, uh, we, even though Sabespi has been investing a lot in those uh, areas, our tariff is still the fifth lowest tariff in Brazil. So it, it shows that with uh, proper management and proper uh, financing, we can, uh, we, we can make things happen. So it must rec be recognized that reducing risks uh, is highly beneficial for the whole economy. So thinking about the uh, out of the box uh, usually pays. So that's what we did uh, with, for instance, our redundancy uh, investments. And just the interconnection between uh, two neighboring bases uh, to create this redundancy for the metropolitan region of Sao Paulo cost about $150 million. But it made a, all the difference last year uh, when uh, we had a very, another very dry year. So uh, I think that uh, this uh, to work in adaptation, uh, to work in reducing risks is uh, common to every area on when we talk about water resources, when we talk about security. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And thank you. Thank you so, so much. Really uh, interesting to hear how a leading uh, utility in the world is really taking uh, uh, such uh, innovative uh, approaches to both uh, resilience uh, and uh, and uh, mitigation. Thank you very much for sharing. Last but not least, I would like to invite Mr. Tongi Holmgren, who is the executive director of the Stockholm International Water Institute. And Ambassador Holmgren, please offer your remarks. You've heard quite a few speakers. Good. Uh, thanks a lot, and thanks a lot for having me here. Let me start by maybe broadening the scope a bit, if you allow me, to go beyond what we have discussed on large scale or irrigation at large. And I will mostly focus on the small farmers that are relying on rain fed agriculture and mainly focusing on countries that not have the possibility due to topography and other causes to have the, the irrigation as we discussed. This is an add-on, I would say. And why I start on this is that in our institute, we have Professor Malin Falkenmark, who is a senior scientific advisor, to us, and she coined the expression or concept of green water a few decades ago. So let's start by the smallholder farmers who rely on, on rain-fed uh, agriculture. They are the bulk of food supply in many countries around the world. And what we can do to help those farmers to have a more even planting season as the hydrological cycles are so different today. We don't know when rainfall will come. We don't know exactly how much, but you can store the rain on, on the farm. And this is very cheap in, in, uh, kind of, of, of tools that you need. It's some $50, $70 per farm. But with millions of farmers, I think you're going to minister your microfinance schemes are needed to make that happen. And with millions of farmers, of course, you can also have a good of food supply uh, all over the year. And this is good, of course, for the climate as you have the soil moisture, which also will be uh, capturing carbon. And that, of course, goes for any kind of food, uh, uh, food production. 
So it's good for the farmer, for the community, and also for uh, the climate. We have calculated together with some researchers, it's oh, some 50, 70 dollars per farm to do that. But with hundreds of millions of farmers, it's up to hundreds of billions of dollars that is needed in those financing schemes. I will end up by quoting the most recent uh, issue of The Economist, uh, the climate issue last week, that said that small amounts of cash could ward off many of the worst effects climate change will have. But in most cases, no such help is coming. So I think it's called for all of us. So in addition to what we have in immigration schemes, we also should supply, supply these microfinance possibilities for farmers of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now I end up with two microphones in my hands. I wish to uh, extend a very warm uh, thank you to all of our distinguished guests for sharing your experiences. Amazing. All the best in your work. Thank you for joining. And uh, to everybody who's watched us online, thank you. And good afternoon from Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt. Thank you. Thank you.